welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. Hello, Walter. Good day. Are you doing well? Yes, I'm fine. Good. We're going to discuss various topics today again. So I'll open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us these opportunities. Will you please bless us, enlighten our minds with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Well, Martin, I understand that it is question time. Yeah. I like the questions because we get various topics, but it also gives us some Bible studies. Yes, we have to do some Bible studies when we want to do these things. Yeah. And uh, yeah, some of them are, you know, issues that are troubling to people. Well, all of them, otherwise there wouldn't be a yeah. question. And uh, many of the questions deal, deal with the criticism to, way, to the way in which the Adventists, for example, interpret texts. Yes. And so it's, it's good that we have these opportunities so we can see what does the Bible say. Yeah, and it's good for everybody to go with us through this to see if we maybe err, err um, a point or so and then you can show it us, out to us or maybe there's something you didn't know and well, we can all learn together. You know what? This, this issue of studying what the Bible says has been a bone of contention for a very long time, right? Correct. Eons. Yeah. And so nobody can say that they have it all together. Mm. Nobody. And everybody can make a mistake here and a mistake there, and we have to be, we have to be kind to each other. And if there is a mistake, you point it out and you say, you could have seen it this way or that way. And uh, yes, there's room for that too. So nobody says that what we say is the be all and end all. There are others that interpret things differently. But to the best of our knowledge, we will try and answer it according to the scriptures. Amen. That's the standard. Yes. So let's go on to a question. Since Christ entered into the holy place before the pre-advent judgment, what was his officiating role or ministry prior to him entering into the holy of holies? This is a very interesting question. and it, it Actually, the question contains more than one would imagine at first glance, right? Mm. Because this whole issue, where did he go? Did he go into the holy place? Did he go into the most holy place? That is a, that is a major problem in the world today. Yes. And why is it important to know whether mm -hmm. he went into the holy place or whether he went into the most holy place? And what did he do, according to this question, before... He yep. actually entered into this ministry. Correct. Because the Bible says that he entered the sanctuary above, not with the blood of bulls and goats, etc., mm -hmm. but with his own blood. So the actual ministry in the sanctuary couldn't begin until Christ had paid the price. Yes. Because he had to enter with his own blood. So what did he do before? Mm -hmm. That's a good question, yes. right? Well, a post-dated check. You know what a post-dated check is, Martin? Yes. Today, people don't use checks anymore no. in many countries. Yeah. In the United States, they still use checks, but in many countries... In our country, it's not. No, that they're that outdated. That. We don't use checks anymore. But sometimes when you wanted to pay something, but you didn't have the actual funds, you wrote another date and you gave that to the person and only after that date could they actually use the check. Mm. But they had the guarantee in their hand. Correct. Right? Yeah. So the ministry of Christ before was really a post-dated check. And it was by promise that he acted out what he promised to do in the future. the future. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, let's give a few examples why 
It is absolutely essential that we understand that Christ's ministry has never changed. changed. It's been the same from the beginning. The plan of salvation was laid at the foundations, right? Correct. Let's take a few examples. Enoch, hmm. was he taken to heaven? Yes. Okay. Was the actual price for Enoch's sin, hmm. because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, paid for at that stage? No, not yet. No, it wasn't paid for. Hmm. And yet he was taken to heaven without seeing death. Now, that was a guarantee to the antediluvian world before the flood mm -hmm. that God's promise was actually true. Correct. That those who were faithful and followed him would actually go to heaven, right? Mm -hmm. So they had a guarantee. And then they had a prediction as to when retribution would come. And Noah preached for 120 years. And when Methuselah should die, then it would come. So they had the prophetic word. They had the spirit of prophecy. Yes. But they also had a guarantee that God could be trusted in terms of his word, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a post date to check. Now, the other example that we have is uh, Moses. Moses died. And then there was an argument between Michael and the devil over the body of Moses. Mm -hmm. And I can understand why the devil was extremely frustrated because here Moses was raised from the dead mm -hmm. and he was taken to heaven. And the devil said, excuse me, <laughs> what right do you have to take him to heaven mm -hmm. and to resurrect him and take him to heaven? What right do you have? Because after all, you haven't paid the price. The price hasn't been paid. He has no right to go to heaven. And uh, the Lord didn't argue with him. He just said to him, <laughs> the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Yeah. And he took him. So there's another post days to check. Yeah. So, question. Was his sin forgiven, Moses' sin? Yes, he was declared righteous. And he was taken to heaven. Yes. Okay. Uh, who declared him righteous? Jesus. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Who atoned for him? Jesus. But he hadn't done it yet. Done it yet, no. So what was it? It's a post data check. A post data check. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's take another example. Elijah. Was he taken to heaven without seeing death? Yes. Correct, right? Mm -hmm. He never saw death. He was taken to heaven. Was he declared righteous? Yes. Righteous enough to represent the living at the end of time that wouldn't see death. Mm -hmm. So you have Moses as the example of those that would die and be resurrected because they had been counted worthy. Blessed are those who have part in the first resurrection. And he was taken to heaven. So his sins were atoned for. Mm -hmm. And everything that Christ did and will be, would do in the future in the sanctuary he actually did by promise before yes so that's what he did now let's just expand while we're at this because you know it's important that people understand how this actually works the sanctuary is actually a model of how the plan of salvation works now we've discussed that many times so we're not going to go into the sanctuary uh, in detail at all, but that is a mini enactment of how the plan of salvation works. And the actual plan of salvation, the price that had to be paid, the atonement that had to take place, and the officiating work of our high priest actually commenced when the blood was available because he didn't enter with the blood of sheep and goats. Now the earthly sanctuary had a holy place and a most holy place. And the high priest went into the holy place on a daily basis throughout the year, but only once a year on the Day of Atonement did he go into the most, most holy place. 
And then the record of sin was removed in type and placed upon the scapegoat. The scapegoat didn't pay for those sins mm. because it took blood to atone for those sins. So only the blood of Christ can atone for the sins. Mm -hmm. But eventually, all the sins that have been forgiven, that record of sin will be removed and placed upon the scapegoat. In other words, Christ is going to hold Satan accountable for what he incited us to do. Yes. And that's a, a very beautiful thing. That's why the scapegoat didn't die. He's not a sin bearer for you. Mm -hmm. He didn't pay any price. But he's going to have to deal with the consequences. Yes. Because you have been redeemed, right? Correct. So on a daily basis, the priest would officiate in the holy place. In other words, every penitent sinner that came with his offering of a lamb would confess his sins over the lamb and then the lamb was put to death and that blood was the life that flowed out represented the lamb of God whose blood would atone for our sins. So that life that was paid, that blood, was paid because of my sin and therefore it was recorded in the sanctuary in the holy place onto the horns of the altar we could in modern terms say they were mega hard drives <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> where the record of sin was stored yeah okay and they only went in to download it onto the they hard downloaded drive. it and only when that blood was actually taken inside was your sin taken inside and it had been atoned for because there was blood now that's a very that's a very beautiful symbolism atonement and the blood of Christ how it paid for your sins but the record was there mm -hmm. now in in heaven one day you will be as though you had never sinned so that record must be removed Correct. eventually mm. the price has been paid so let's just go into a little bit of detail there because the world would like everyone to believe uh, that Christ entered into the most holy at his ascension. Now we've dealt with this before, but let's just go into a little bit more detail while we have this question. Okay. So everything that happened before Christ was crucified was a post-dated check yes. by promise. Mm -hmm. Everything that happened thereafter was an actuality. Yes. The one served as a type, the sanctuary on earth, which was a type of the heavenly, mm -hmm. so says Hebrews. So that which prefigured what would happen in heaven was enacted in the Jewish economy. That which happened because it had become a reality was enacted in the Christian economy. Does that make sense? Yes. So the New Testament is the expositor of the old and the two blend together so that we can understand. Now Hebrews chapter 4 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. So here is the great antitype, Jesus, our high priest. And he has gone into heaven to officiate in the sanctuary on our behalf with the blood. Now if the earthly had a ministry stretching over the year in the holy and then going into the most, most holy, holy mm -hmm. then the heavenly must have the same. Yes. So we could ask ourselves, why do some people say he went into the most holy? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very interesting question because that would enter, uh, introduce a whole can of worms because we will see when we get to Daniel chapter 8 and 9 why it is important. But if the earthly was a pattern of the heavenly, then he would have to enter into the holy first. Mm -hmm. 
So when did Jesus enter the Holy of Holies? Was it in 1844? This is another question, right? Yes, so we'll deal with that. This, yeah. They work together, these yeah. questions. Or was there a kind of sanctuary opening before that? After the resurrection, how many times did Jesus ascend to heaven? So here is a whole host of questions. In actual fact, we don't know how many times Jesus ascended into heaven. Mm -hmm. We know that he ascended into heaven after he spoke to Mary. Correct. Right? Yeah. Because I go to my father. I have not yet been to my father. I will go to my father and I will come again. But the Bible d doesn't tell us what happened in those 40 days. Whether he frequently went up or not, we don't know. Correct. Correct. So as for the rest of the things, let's just go into this question of 1844. Now we're not going to deal with the prophecy, but uh, just briefly we will say where it comes from in a moment. Daniel 8 verse 14. And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, this verse is the one that deals with 1844. Now, if you just read Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, you don't know where this prophecy starts, and you don't know when it ends. Mm -hmm. Because in order to work it out, you must have a starting point. Yes. Now, there's no starting point in here. So you cannot work it out from here. Mm -hmm. But in Daniel chapter 9, there is a starting point. Therefore, you can work it out. And in Daniel chapter 9, there are some major events that are mentioned in chronological order so that you know that you are on the right track. Yes. All right? So... When does this prophecy start and when does it end? Well, in Daniel chapter 9, it tells you that from the issuing of the decree mm -hmm. to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. And then there's a time prophecy, the 70-week prophecy. Yes. And this portion, it says, is cut off from the entire time. Yeah. So if you have a starting point and you take the years, it happens to work out at 1844. Mm -hmm. There is no other date that it can work out on. And because all the checks and balances are there in between, the Messiah, when he would come, mm -hmm. that he would die in the middle of the week, and all of these issues verifying the prophecy, that is what it works out at. Yes. And we've had this discussion before. There were so many isms that took place in 1844. Mm -hmm evolutionism, existentialism, all of these issues, communism, everything started in 1844. Spiritism plus Adventism. All of them started in 1844. That is not Coincidence. coincidental. No. Plus, of course, the Industrial Revolution, the communication systems, yes. transport systems, everything started in 1844. Mm -hmm. In other words, the message had to go to, out to the entire world. So when Jesus entered into the sanctuary, where did he go? Daniel 8, 17. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. This is very important. Mm -hmm. And then he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. Anybody who in the light of these verses wants to cut off the Old Testament from the New and say it has nothing to do with us has a serious problem now. Yes. Would you agree? Definitely. And that's why Jesus said, showing back to the prophet Daniel. Yes. You have to have this. You have to understand this. If you don't understand this, you don't know where you are in the stream of time. Yep. And we want to deal with the stream of time. Now, Martin, <laughs> when you deal with the stream of time, you get into trouble. Yes. Uh, have you got your seatbelt on? <laughs> because yes. we might get into trouble again. 
but we'll say it very carefully. <laughs> but we'll see. Anyway, so the prophecy, obviously the beginning of the prophecy, was from the decree when Jerusalem should be restored. That is way in Old Testament times. Mm -hmm. And the Messiah takes us to the New Testament times. Yes. And to the very end, when, it, when the in last indignation will take place, takes us to our time. Yes. So the prophecy spans the whole period. It's a very important prophecy. Now let's go to Daniel chapter 9. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, because Daniel couldn't understand these things. Mm. Even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening ablation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. So, understand the matter and consider the vision. If that applied to Daniel, do you think it applies to us? Definitely. So we must we understand the matter and consider, consider the vision. Yeah, That's part of what we should do. And Jesus himself said, when you see these things, uh, go and look at what Daniel said, right? Correct. So Jesus wants us to understand this. And then follows the 70-week prophecy, which we've dealt with before. We're not going to deal with it, but just for completeness. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. That's a mouthful. Yeah. So this concerned the Jewish era. When the Jewish era would come to an end. There was a 70-week prophecy and thereafter would come the Christian era. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And in this prophecy, you have words that humanity cannot fulfill. Finish transgression. Mm -hmm. Make an end of sins. Reconciliation for iniquity. Bring in everlasting righteousness. Who can do that? Only Jesus. Only Jesus can do that. So this takes us up to the point of Jesus. And then to seal up the vision and the prophecy. Which takes us to where? The right end. to the end of time. Yes. Okay. So this is the ultimate spirit ban the eons prophecy mm -hmm. and we should understand the matter and consider the vision right 100 percent. okay uh, one more point over here and to anoint the most holy that is actually the sanctuary mm -hmm. so you have the sanctuary message in here as well and it is the anointing of the Most Holy. So what does the word anoint mean? Aha, uh -huh. the consecration. So this will take us to the consecration of the sanctuary. So that means to the time when, when Jesus will enter into that ministry. Yes. Okay. And this is important because the word there is to anoint the Most mm -hmm. Holy. And this is fascinating. What an amazing verse. You know, Martin, there are people that say that uh, people with, with long scruffy hair and ugly beards living in caveman-style environments wrote this book. Yeah, there's people that say that. And the greatest geniuses of all time have never been able to unravel it completely, right? Correct. <laughs> if this isn't the Word of God, then I don't know. I've read many books in my life. But, but this is the only book that you can never exhaust. No. You cannot exhaust it. 
even in a sentence, in a few words, it can sometimes when you read it again, wow, I didn't see this, and it blows you away because it's a whole. I once I once listened to a, a series of lectures on one verse in Daniel, mm. one verse, and it was eight one and a half hour lectures, <laughs> <laughs> one verse. I, and I, you don't even know that you can get all of that out of exactly. one verse. I, I also I know of one person that did his doctor doctorate, his thesis on one verse. Absolutely, of the Bible, Col- Colossians two verse sixteen. Well, you can you can do a, a thesis plus write a thousand volumes yeah. on three words <laughs> in the beginning. In the <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's. A that's a major already. Anyway, let's go and see what happens there. Hebrews 9 verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. That's the King James Version. And it says holy place. And the word is hagion which actually means sanctuary, but he entered into the holy place. Mm. Hebrews 9 verse 12 in the NIV says, He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place, Mm. once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Now, which one of the two is right? We have to compare it with the rest of the Bible. Not only that, this one here, uh, in my opinion, is dishonest. Yes. Because most holy place is Hagia Hagion. Mm. But this just says Hagion. So is there an agenda here? I believe there is an agenda. Because does it make a difference? You see, the date 1844 is an incredibly important date. Because it takes us to the end of the 2,300 day prophecy and it happens to end in 1844. And after that date, there will be the cleansing of the sanctuary. Mm. Cleanse it from what? Was the sanctuary dirty? No, it only had the record of sin. It had the record of sin. And it needs to be cleansed from the record of sin. Mm -hmm. So the cleansing of the sanctuary fits in with the Day of Atonement. Yes. When there was this day of judgment and the people had to repent and think about themselves and make right with God because at the end when he Mm -hmm. came out the high priest and he placed his hands on the scapegoat, if you were not part of that process, you were cut off. Yes. Right? So that is the investigative judgment. So when you make him enter into the most holy place, then there is no period where you can say, okay, now this day of atonement has begun. Mm. Because then we've been living in it for the last 2,000 years, right? Correct. And that's a problem. So in other words, by translating it like this, you get rid of the Advent movement. Yes. Totally. The Advent movement becomes irrelevant. And the Advent movement does not become a gathering of people out of all denominations, but just another part of the soup. Mm. So he has to get rid of the last message of warning. And the last message of warning is the three angels' messages. By making it holy holy place, by changing it into most holy place, you get rid of the three angels' messages. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Totally. And you get rid of the call, come out of my people. You get rid of everything. There is no final message. But here's a question, Martin. In the antediluvian world, did God have a final message? Yes. He did? Yes, and he gave it through Noah. And how long did he preach that message? 120 years. 120 years. Mm. Now, I'm being a little bit daring here. (laughs) Uh, if you if you take 120 jubilees, how many years do you get? Isn't it 6,000? 
6,000 years. That's interesting. And when you read, you know, in the spirit of prophecy, you have that date mentioned many, many times. But uh, we're on very troublesome ground. May I ask another naughty question? <laughs> yes. How old was Moses when he was translated? 120 years. Uh, is that coincidental or was it specifically planned? Did God say, walk up to the mountain, I'm going to put you to sleep? And the Bible says his eyesight was still perfect. Everything of him was still perfect. So he wasn't that he was sickly. Okay. So now, what maybe is there was something more to the 120. All right. So he, ha he suffered a death, but he also had a resurrection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the resurrection, isn't that a type of the end? Yes. So if you had 120 years there, could you have 120 years later? Now, this is how some of the pioneers used to think. Mm -hmm. And today, many people believe that that is obsolete. But I like their thinking. I like their thinking. But we're on dangerous ground, so <laughs> let's just skip to another level here. But the point of the matter is, is it important? And I say, yes, it is exceedingly important. And we've had many, Martin, many attacks in the world against the Advent message. And it is essential to the opponents to have Jesus enter into the most holy place, to get rid of the relevance of the judgment message. Yes. That's mm -hmm. it, right? And even within our own oh, ranks, yeah. there have been attacks on this. Uh, and I think of Ford, for yes, example, Ford. who would make it quite a point that he entered into the most holy. Mm. And many, many a theologian will agree with him. Well, it becomes troublesome if you use the NIV because then you... <laughs> you can't prove anything. Yeah, then you actually have a point. <laughs> yes. So there's a point here which is very interesting. And we spoke about anoint the most holy. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And the word there was the sanctuary. Yes. So the anointing of the tabernacle. When did that take place? Mm -hmm. And what happened there? And actually, you have to go through the whole of Leviticus chapter 8. And uh, here's an interesting uh, statement from the Signs of the Times. And this statement has been used many times to say that Jesus entered into the Most Holy when he ascended up to heaven. Okay. okay? And Ford quoted this. Mm to say that he went into the Most Holy. But he would very cleverly leave out a little portion. So I'm not going to read his. I'm going to read it as it was. Okay? okay. Christ's glory did not appear when he was upon this earth. He was then a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Men hid their faces from him. But he was following the path God had marked out for him. Still bearing humanity, he ascended to heaven, triumphant and victorious. He has taken the blood of the atonement into the holiest of all. That's the most holy place. Mm -hmm. Sprinkled it upon the mercy seat and his own garments and blessed the people. Soon he will appear the second time to declare that there is no more sacrifice for sin. Now Martin, when you read that statement, where did he go? Into the most holy. Aha, uh -huh. he went into the most holy. But we've just read in the King James that he went into the holy. Now, if you read the modern ones, he went into the most holy. And then the judgment message is gone. And wherever you read, in the spirit of prophecy, it says he officiated in the holy. Mm. Except here, he went to the holiest of all. But then you must read very carefully. He sprinkled it upon the mercy seat. Where's that? In the most holy. In the most holy. Mm. And his own garments. 
Now Ford cleverly removed this little section here and his own garments and blessed the people. Soon he will appear the second time to declare that there is no more sacrifice for sin. Now why is it important that he removed and his own garments? That's blatantly, I don't want to use the word, yeah. it's a, a blatant falsification. Let's be kind. All right, why is it important? Okay, let's go to Leviticus chapter 8. Oh, we don't have to go through it all, but there are some salient points here which are very interesting. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and a bullock for the sin offering, and two rams, and a basket of unleavened bread. And gather thou all the congregation together unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So now, this was a ceremony to anoint the sanctuary for its first use. Okay. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and the assembly was gathered together unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Moses said unto the congregation, This is the thing which the Lord commanded to be done. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. Now this is fascinating. So he took them to the laver mm -hmm. and he washed them with water. He washed them. They couldn't wash themselves. Yeah. They were now being anointed for their task of the priesthood. And they had to be of the descendants of Aaron. Yeah. And Moses, of course, was the brother mm -hmm. of Aaron. And Moses is taking an important position here. He's anointing Aaron and his sons to the priesthood, and he washes them. What does that tell you? That they couldn't do it of themselves? They couldn't do it the themselves. Mm -hmm. So this must have been quite embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Here is Moses, and he is washing them. This tells us that Christ is the one that washes us. Yes. All right. And he put on him the coat and girded him with the girdle and clothed him with the rope and put the ephod upon him and girded him with the curious girdle of the ephod and bound it unto him therewith. So who clothed him? Moses. Yes. Yes. He probably had his undergarments on and the officiating robe, but this rest of the clothing was placed upon him by Moses. Mm. So in type, who clothes you with the robe of righteousness? Jesus. Christ. Right? Yes. And he put the breastplate upon him, and in the breastplate the Urim and the Tumen. And he put the mitre upon his head, also upon the mitre, even upon his forefront, did he put the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord commanded Moses. So here is holiness unto the Lord. So they were set apart for a holy use. They were anointed. And Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle. And all that was therein and sanctified them. Right? All that Everything. was therein. Yeah. Does that include the Ark of the Covenant? Yes. Well, if you want to make absolutely sure, just go to Exodus chapter 30, where we have a this prior description of what happened there. And we will go to verse 26 where this took place, this ceremony. And God said to him, And thou shalt anoint the tabernacle. Did we read that in Daniel? Yes. Of the congregation therewith, and the ark of the testimony. 
and the table and all its vessels and the candlesticks and his vessels and the altar of incense. Now, where were they? In, In the, the holy, holy place. All right. So he had to anoint the most holy, holy place and, the holy. and he had to anoint the, the holy place and the altar of burnt mm -hmm. offering with all his vessels and the laver and his foot. Where was that? Outside. So he had to anoint the entire ridiculous. sanctuary. Okay? And thou shalt sanctify them, that they may be most holy. Whatsoever touches them shall be holy. Now, Martin, in all the Bible, when you touch something unclean, mm -hmm. you become unclean. Yes. But here we have the reverse. <laughs> the holy. If you touch it, you're holy. Yeah. All right? But nobody was allowed in there unless they fulfilled certain conditions or else they would die. Mm. Now, this is very important. So if we go back to chapter 8 in Leviticus. We reach verse 10 again. And Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was therein and sanctified them. So this is a summary of what we've just read. Mm. And he sprinkled thereof upon the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all his vessels, both the laver and his foot, to sanctify them. So there was a lot of activity around the altar of burnt offering yeah. because this typified Christ and his sacrifice. And he poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. Now this oil, that was poured on his head. It was such a copious stream of oil that it dripped off his beard. Mm. What does that symbolize? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. So God wants to anoint the priesthood with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it's almost drenching yourself. Drenching him yeah. that the oil dripped. It was a fascinating ritual and it is full of symbolism. And Moses brought Aaron's sons and put coats upon them. So who dressed them? Moses. Moses. Mm. And girded them with girdles and put bonnets upon them as the Lord commanded Moses. And this holiness to the Lord is very essential. And it was written on the forehead. What, what is there in the forehead? The seat of your consciousness. Oh, okay, okay yes. God also said he'll write this law on the heart. On the heart. And you had to put it there yes. in your mind. It had to be in your mind. You're quite right. And he brought the bullock for the sin offering. So here in the anointing ceremony, in the, in the first ceremony that took place before the sanctuary could be used, the whole sanctuary had to be anointed. And the high priest had to be anointed. Mm. This is a type. Now, if we continue, and he lays hands upon the head of the bullock for the sin offering, and he slew it, and Moses took the blood and put it upon the horns of the altar, round about with his finger, and purified the altar, and poured the blood at the bottom of the altar, and sanctified it to make reconciliation upon it. Now, the ritual with the bullock is, is very extensive. There was to be a washing as well. There was water and blood involved. Mm. And when Jesus died, there was water, water and, blood. and blood involved. And it concerned the entire sanctuary and the people. Mm -hmm. And he took all the fat that was upon the inwards and the caul above the liver and the two kidneys and their fat. And Moses burnt it upon the altar. Now the fat stands for sin. And that will be burnt away. Yeah. But the bullock and his hide... His flesh and his dung he burnt with fire without the camp. Where was Christ crucified? Without the camp. Yes. And he brought the ram for the burnt offering, and then they sacrificed the ram, etc. And in verse 22, we read, And he brought the other ram, the ram of consecration, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the ram, and he slew it. And Moses took of the blood of it and put it upon the tip of Aaron's right ear. Now this is all very fascinating. So firstly it was a ram. Mm -hmm. 
Now, there were two kinds of offerings. There was an offering of a lamb, and there was an offering of a ram. But here in the consecration, it was a ram. Now, the ram represents Christ in his maturity. The lamb represents Christ at the beginning of his ministry. So, Christ is both. He's the lamb, and but he's also the ram. And he paid the price. Now, this blood was placed on different parts of the body. He put it on Aaron's right ear. Mm -hmm. Be careful what you hear, my friend, and what you listen to, and how you discern what you are listening to. And upon the thumb of his right hand, mm -hmm. note to this day, when you go to the bank <laughs> and you register your bank account, uh, well, they use the whole hand now, but in the old days it was always the thumbprint, thumb. right? Now the thumb is the one that moves your hand and it is basically a symbol of how you use your hand. Mm. In other words, what you do. Be careful what you do. And upon the great toe of his right foot. Okay. Be careful where you walk. You must walk in the ways of the Lord. You must listen to his word. You must understand his word. And uh, you must also act. You must act accordingly. And he brought Aaron's sons and Moses, put the blood upon the tip of their right ear and upon the thumb of their right hand and upon the great toe of their right feet. And Moses sprinkled the blood upon the altar round about. So these people were being sanctified. Absolutely sanctified. And there were many rules that were applied uh, to the priesthood. For example, they were not allowed to drink wine or strong drink. And very shortly thereafter, Nah Nahab and mm, Abidu, yeah. they drank mm. and they died as a consequence. Yes. So when the Bible says that... Uh, in the New Testament times, those that follow Christ will be a royal priesthood. They must what follow in the same. What does that mean? It means you must be careful what you yeah. hear. You must be careful what you do. Mm -hmm. And you must be careful how you walk, the Christian walk, right? Mm -hmm. And if you want to be part of the priesthood, then you must abstain from the anything alcoholic, exactly. right? Exactly. Okay. But uh, we're still getting to the point here. Mm. We're being a little bit laborsome here for the people, but let's try. And then there are other issues and, and offerings that they had to do and the wave offering, etc. Mm. And all of that, even the wave offering, all of this we can spend a long time because all of this is symbolic as well. Every with single one. Christ's ministry after his crucifixion up in the heavenly sanctuary. Correct. But now we get to the crux of the matter. If you read verse 30, And Moses took of the anointing oil and of the blood, which was upon the altar, and sprinkled it upon Aaron and upon his garments. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. And upon his sons and upon his sons' Son. garments with him and sanctified Aaron and his Garment. garments and his sons and his sons' garments. <laughs> is the Lord making a point there? Yes. I think he is, right? Now, Martin, this ritual of sprinkling the blood on the garments mm -hmm took place only once. Yeah. When the sanctuary was consecrated for use, thereafter they entered into ministry in the holy place. And only once a year did they enter into the most okay. holy place. Now if you read this statement from the Spirit of Prophecy, let's read it again. Christ's glory did not appear when he was upon the earth. Okay. He came as a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Men hid their faces from him.
but he was following the path God had marked out for him, still bearing humanity. He ascended to heaven. This is now after the resurrection. Yeah. Triumphant and victorious. He has taken the blood of the atonement into the holiest of all sprinkled it upon the mercy seat and his own garments and blessed the people. What an, what ceremony was that? The anointing. of The, the initiation yes. ceremony. So when did the sanctuary ministry begin? When Christ ascended to heaven. When was the sanctuary consecrated for use? On the same day. Ah, so when Christ ascended into heaven, mm -hmm. the consecration ceremony took place. That is the first time that the sanctuary may be used by the high priest. So was he in the sanctuary prior or not? No. No, it hadn't been consecrated. Here's the consecration ceremony. Correct. And according to Leviticus chapter 8, it had to take place before the high priest could officiate as high priest. So he consecrated the whole tabernacle, including the most holy, and then went back into the holy and ministered there. Correct. And he stayed in the holy for a period of time until the sanctuary had to be cleansed. Cleansed. Mm. From what? From the record of sin. Okay. Now can you understand, Martin, how sneaky it is to remove these words and his garments? True. Yeah, because then it totally changes the whole... Yes, then it could be anywhere, any time. Mm. Then it actually means he went, he went into the most holy, finished. Correct. Yeah. But this only happened at the consecration. Here's another point. The accuracy of the spirit of prophecy stuns me every time when no, I read it. This is amazing. This is amazing, isn't yeah. it? Now there are people, Martin, that say that this person that wrote these kinds of things suffered under pathology of the brain or had epileptic attacks as we said before mm. and they have never ever ever studied her over and over again except to prove her wrong yeah or to get rid of some accusation which is uncomfortable for yes. them right and just think how important it was that this ceremony should take place like it did. How humbling it must have been for Aaron and his sons. Yes, that Moses yes. had to consecrate them. And then, after this, they had to stay there mm -hmm. for seven days. In other words, they probably had to practice over and over and mm -hmm. over again to make sure they make no mistake. And they had no righteousness of them, oh, their own. It was placed upon them. They were not washing themselves. They were washed. And their garments were sprinkled with the blood. And this made them righteous. Only through the sprinkling of the blood can you become righteous. If this isn't the pen of an inspired person, then I've never read an inspired person mm. in my life. So I hope that answers the question whether Christ went into the holy or into the most holy. Now there's also people that say, but the throne of the Father is in the most holy. So that's why he went, and then in Revelation it says he's before he's, he went to the Ancient of Days. So how do we explain that part? Well, you see, people have this idea that God is fixed in a place. Mm. But the throne of God is mobile. Yes. If you read the, the vision of Ezekiel, for example, mm -hmm. you have an explanation of the mobile throne of God. And there was more than one throne. There yes. was a throne in the holy place as well. Correct. Uh, the altar of showbread mm -hmm. was also a throne. And, and it has two crowns. It has it. a crown around it, mm. yes. Two crowns. Two crowns. Because he will sit in his father's throne. Correct. 
they will both be part of that throne. Mm. So in the same way, Christ isn't pinned down. He moves, yeah. but his officiation mm. is holy place officiation. Uh, you know, actually, this typology and these teachings are so beautiful. Yes. So, Martin, if he entered into the holy, then at some stage he must move into the most holy if he's going to fulfill the prefigurement in the Old Testament, right? Mm -hmm. He must move into the most holy at some stage. There is no verse in the Bible other than the prophecy of the 2,300 days that gives you a cleansing of the sanctuary period. So 1844 becomes very relevant. Mm. If 1844 becomes relevant because the prophecy has to be fulfilled, then the judgment message, the time of his judgment has come, come yes. must be relevant, right? Mm -hmm. Now, God could dispense with all of that. I mean, God is all-knowing. Mm -hmm. He doesn't need books of record. He doesn't have to prove himself to anyone. But that's not his character. No. It's for the others. So, us, that, so there are books of record. Yes. So that everybody at the end of the entire process will be able to satisfy themselves that God is just mm. and fair and righteous and true and just and righteous. They will say, are your judgments. Beautiful. It's beautiful. The plan of salvation is complete. But if you ignore one little nuance, yeah, yeah. one little and his garments, yeah. Yeah. you end up in total confusion. And then also, when he was in the holy place, and then in 1844 he went into the judgment with the ho most holy, it doesn't mean that he doesn't fulfill his role of the holy place anymore. He Otherwise there would be no hope for anyone, right? He's still the light of the world, still Absolutely. the bread of life. Yes. And his, pr his righteousness still mingles with the prayers. And while probation instance. closes, you have access to him. He still officiates typologically for you at the altar of incense. He's still the light of the world. He is the bread of the presence of mm -hmm. God. All of those things happen at the same time. But the judgment, judgment has is, commenced. Yes. So Martin, I hope that that answers the question. In my mind and according to the scripture, there can be no doubt mm. that when Christ ascended into heaven, there was a consecration ceremony where the blood was also brought into the most holy. Yes. And the blood was sprinkled on his garments. So it is the consecration ceremony. Yes. And thereafter, Christ then officiated in the holy until we get to the end of the 2,300-day prophecy because that's the only one that tells me when the change took place. Yes. And that's 1844. Yes. And Daniel told us mm. that the prophecy takes us to the very last events. That means it must take us to the last message of warning. Yes, and that is the three angels' messages. The three angels' messages. And the three angels' messages are the equivalent of what happened in the days of Noah because he had the type. The destruction is coming. Yes. Get ye into the ark. So the last generation also has the instruction. The judgment is coming. The time of your judgment has come, of the judgment has come. Worship God who made the heavens, the earth, etc., etc., right? Correct. That's the first angel's mm -hmm. message. Mm -hmm. And then comes the warning against Babylon. Yeah. And then comes the warning mm -hmm. against the yep. mark of the beast, which is making void God's law. And then appeared in the book of Revelation the Ark of the Covenant in heaven. Yes. And you look up and you see the Ark of the Covenant. What was in the Ark of the Covenant? The law. The law. So the law will again be made prominent at the end of time. Mm -hmm. It's part of the message. Choose thee this day whom you will serve. Either you're serving Baal, 
and the representative of Baal, or you are serving God. Yes. Either you obey God's commandments or you obey the commandments of men. That is the issue at, yes. at the end of time, right? So Daniel tells us this is the final thing that will happen on this earth. And we are living in that time. Mm. Do you think when this actually comes to fruition and this message goes out into the world, do you think it will be a popular message? No. No. No, definitely not. Noah's message wasn't popular. Mm. Many people must have thought and wondered, you know, when those animals started going into the ark, I mean, what was that natural phenomenon that brought that about, right? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that God brought the animals. God brought them. Because there was some amalgamation that had taken place. So those creatures that had been genetically compromised mm. were not brought into the ark and so here you have the same situation we have another ark mm. the ark is is the final church of god where yes. people must be called into its uh, fellowship right and associated also we have the ark of the covenant mm -hmm. and everybody has to make this decision for or against accepting this sprinkling that we were speaking about. So I think it's a very important issue that we understand the sanctuary, that we understand the place of the law, and we did a whole lecture on that uh, just in the previous WhatsApp. Yes. So I'm amazed sometimes, Martin, how God, and I believe it is God, is leading in the discussions of that we are having. <laughs> it's not as if we sit beforehand and work out a list of this is what we're going to discuss next. No, we don't. Because now, the, like, this is what happens. Something like a question like this gets answered, and then it leads to something else that God wants maybe. Yes, and then there's to, something to, yeah. else and something else. And I was just thinking now, when you mentioned the Ark of the Covenant, all of this, we should do a talk on the covenants of God. The covenants of God, yes. Because what is the covenant, right? Yes. Are there different covenants? We'll have to talk about that. Yes, we'll have to talk about that because people are confused. They think that the new covenant makes the old covenant yeah. obsolete. But as we see, the Old Testament is actually the type of the New Testament, mm -hmm. right? So nothing makes anything obsolete. It just clarifies so these are things that, that really bother people. And it's all glory, like you said, to God. Absolutely. And so let us study these things together. Let's make sure that we understand where we are in the stream of time. Because I don't know about you, Martin, but I'm absolutely convinced that we are in the last death throes of this planet. And the message of warning is soon going to come to a close. And that door mm -hmm. will be shut, not by us, but by, by God. God. And it is our prayer that everybody will be on board this final ark that will make its way to the sea of glass. Shall we pray? Please. Heavenly Father, what a privilege to have the Word of God at our disposal. And what a privilege to know that only God could inspire such a message. No human being is even capable of putting together such a plot. And then to stretch it over thousands of years in absolute harmony from type to anti-type, from prophetic beginning to prophetic end. I stand astounded and humbled at the word of God. May we all bow down to this word 
and incorporate it into our lives and into our very worship. So that one day we will, can, we will be able to stand before the Son of God and he can acknowledge that we have internalized the bread of life. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.